Today, we're going to look at complications of therapy. And one of the issues that I think we have to recognize is that all extracorporeal therapies have very similar complications. So let's go through in sort of a, uh, a, a first grade level, if you will, of what those complications might be. First of all, we have patients. Patients carry with them certain requirements. So hemodynamics, uh, volume overload, et cetera, volume dysfunction may actually affect how the patient responds to therapy. Then we have access. How do you get the blood from the patient out to your system? Access in and of itself carries a tremendous amount of complications and is considered to be the Achilles heel for all of our extracorporeal therapy. If your access is poor, you won't get blood flow. If your access is kinked, you'll have dysfunctional access problems. If your access gets infected, then you've added to the patient's morbidity. If you've had a complication in putting that access in, you've added to the patient's morbidity. So access per se, no matter how you're doing extracorporeal therapy, is an extremely important piece of information, one. And two, should probably be done by those that are best suited for putting this type of access in. I don't believe that a nephrologist should allow other people to do access work since he or she will be working on that access for his or her system. So unless you have an access specialist, then perhaps access should be better handled by those that are going to be working the system. Next is the tubing. What kind of tubing are you going to use? That tubing can be very soft. It can be kinked. It can be too small for the blood flows that you're running. What about your flow, your blood flow? If your blood flow is too high, you could actually be creating some hemolysis. If your blood flow is too low, you're not creating much in the way of flow to give you an, a, an effective therapy. So blood flow per se. What happens, for example, if the tubing comes disconnected? Well, then you have air getting in there. So air embolus is a big issue. Uh, if you don't have the right designs on your system, your fail-safe designs for air in the system. That's a big issue. If you get over to the kidney, now we're into the kidney. Well, you have a lot of clotting in the kidney. You can have membrane dysfunction in the kidney. The membrane itself can create reaction. You can have problems with back filtration of your dialysate so that your dialysate is not clean, but is actually adding LAL positive material, which are basically thermogenic and sepsis-like producing elements to the patient. So that's a big issue. The whole idea of dialysate, what complications could that create? Acid-base dysfunction, different electrolyte dis, uh, abnormalities or dysfunctions. Uh, the whole issue of how much bicarbonate do you use for what rates of dialysate are you using? That whole issue is very important. Flow back to the patient. What happens if you disconnect here? Frequently, this happens in intermittent therapy or in continuous therapy. And if there's no fail-safe, you have a significant amount of blood loss. So all of these complications are true both in intermittent and continuous therapy. So complications per se on each one of these areas need to be addressed and need to be followed. So moving from the generic complications of any extracorporeal therapy, let's move on to specifics. And so the specific here is with intermittent forms of therapy. Intermittent forms of therapy, probably the biggest complication is hypotension. And that can be induced from volume-related issues where you're trying to remove too much volume over too short a period of time. Solute-related issues where you're removing a large amount of solute over a short period of time with back diffusion of, of uh, material from the dialysate in. A whole series of things that can create hypotension. Well, how frequent is that? Well, if we look at the ATN study, which gave us a good handle on intermittent complications, notice here that the mean arterial pressure dropped as high as 35 or 40, 40 millimeters of mercury during a session. So this gives us a handle on the frequency and severity of the hypotension that's induced by intermittent therapy. But is continuous therapy without any problems? Not really. If we look at continuous therapy, volume is also a related issue. 
volume has, if you don't set your volume correctly, you can perhaps create too much volume loss. If you set your volume too low, you'll still create a volume excess. More importantly is how do you set up your dialysate? For all of the electrolyte abnormalities that you see here, most specifically phosphorus, which was also seen, by the way, in the ATN study to be a real issue with higher dose of whatever form of therapy, but specifically with continuous therapy. If you're not in tune to that, calcium and magnesium, very important issues. Sodium and chlorides, very important issues. What about acid base? If you don't set your dialysate up correctly, if you don't look at the entire patient and see how much alkali they're receiving from their TPN, if you don't control anticoagulation to an extent that you may actually create an alkalemia, if you're not taking care of the entire patient and just looking specifically at renal, you'll probably have problems there. And then we move into the mechanical issues. Mechanical issues such as clotting, membrane rupture, uh, which are sometimes seen both in intermittent and continuous, and membrane reactions. If a patient is not uh, reacting or not biocompatible with the membrane that you're using, that's an important issue and should actually come to the top. And finally, and perhaps one of the more important type of complications in CRT is management errors. Not being attentive to what's going on, both in the support of it, in the attention to the machine when it alarms to let it go, or to just continue to push a button to make sure that the alarm goes away, but not really looking at the root cause for that alarm, or understanding when you're taking care of that patient that you are in fact cooling that patient. So that patient may in fact be developing a febrile response to something, but you're masking it with your cooler dialysate. Those are issues that are extremely important when you have someone on continuous therapy. So perhaps if we then move to overall issues that may in fact create more complications, let's look at the trend of where continuous therapy is going. There's a higher dose trend, especially in the septic patient, for issues of increased clearance of middle molecules or cytokines. There's a whole idea of longer time on dialysis as opposed to shorter time. The increased use of continuous therapy for longer periods of time may expose to more back filtration and more problems. The whole idea of longer times on therapy with amino acid losses, water-soluble vitamin losses may in fact be realized with continuous therapy, not as frequent with intermittent therapy. And then finally, an increased thermal balance, which we've just seen, and the imbalance being created by the cooler dialysate. So we've seen all the complications that we think can be easily controlled by just being aware of the potential for these complications and a close attention to the way that the therapy is produced, the way it's being delivered, and the way it's being monitored. Mm -hmm.